What's up everyone? Welcome back to another video from Personal Finance for Us. They let me out of the basement today. So I just wanted to talk to you guys today about the five myths, financial myths, that you have probably believed or said or things that are well believed within our society. Let's get into it. I can afford it if I can make the payment. This is a huge one. Big rule of thumb. He who negotiates monthly payments loses. Monthly payments are really just a way to try to get you to negotiate with yourself to buy something that maybe is a little bit too expensive and really is out of your budget or to even get you to buy something that you don't really need. Prime example, car payments. Last time we went and test drove a car, we probably really weren't gonna drive it. I just, it was the highest model of my car. I had a Ford Focus ST. I really wanted a Ford Focus RS when it came out. Well, not when it came out, but when it finally came to the United States. So my husband and I went to go test drive one. And before we even met anyone, I said to my husband, I said, I guarantee you they're going to ask us about a monthly payment. Now at that point my ST was already paid for. I didn't have a monthly payment and I was pretty content to keep things that way. But I really wanted to see if the RS was really worth the difference. And maybe there was a slither of me that would have tried to get the car. Maybe a slither. But sure enough, test drive the car. First thing the finance guy wants to know is what kind of payment I'm looking for. And the whole time he's talking, at no point, at no point did he ever take any number off the top. He was never interested in dropping down the price tag of the car. He was only willing to stretch me out as far as 84 months. I'm not paying for any car. 84 months, ever. But that would have only gotten me like $100 and $125 above what my previous payment was, which is exactly what he was looking for. He was looking for me to be able to rationalize that, okay, it's only a little bit more than what I was already paying. I'll get the car. Didn't work. You shouldn't pay a house off early. You need the tax right off. This is a big one. You hear it all the time. I mentioned it in the previous video, but... This is just simply an issue of inability to once again look at the big picture, much like the first financial myth, inability to look at the complete picture. Let's look at an example. This is Bob. Bob makes $50,000 a year. A quick Google search will tell you that means Bob is in the 22% tax bracket. Now, speaking of tax brackets, let's talk about our friends the I, the R, and the S. So for those of you that have never done your taxes before, or are scared to death of it, or intimidated by taxes, there's generally two roads you go down. There's either the standard deduction or an itemized deduction. So what the standard deduction is, is the amount of money that the government says, hey, you can subtract this amount from the money you made this year, or last year, I should say, and we will only tax you on the difference. So with Bob, he made $50,000. Let's say the standard deduction was $5,000. This means Bob's taxable income is only $45,000 instead of the full 50. Contrast that with the itemized deduction. And that means that that's when you bring the whole big binder of receipts to the CPA and they go through and see what of those receipts, what those expenses you incurred can actually be used to increase your deduction. So what they'll do is they'll look at what those qualified expenses are versus what is not, add it all up. And if it's higher than the standard deduction, you would use that. So an important thing to keep in mind as we run through this example, leading up to 2017, only 30% of Americans itemized their taxes, while 60% of 
took the standard deduction. Now, the TCJA, if you guys remember, or the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, that was passed in 2018. And one of the things that that did was it nearly doubled the standard deduction. As a result, it's been estimated that for the year 2019, only about 14% of people would would, uh, would have bothered itemizing for 2019. I guess in due time, with everything being pushed back due to corona, we'll actually see what percentage of people actually did itemize from last year. But that's besides the point. File this into the back of your mind as we work through this ex this exercise. Oh, one other thing I should mention, the TCJA also lowered the amount of certain itemized deductions. So if you could have gotten a $500 deduction for something before, you may only be getting a $250 deduction now. So basically, they've made it much more difficult to itemize things. This is Bob's house. He has a $200,000 mortgage at an interest rate of 5%. Again, some quick math. You'll see that Bob's interest rate, uh, sorry, interest paid annually is about $10,000. Now, you can only itemize mortgage interest if you go down the itemization path. So Bob making $50,000 we can probably assume that he's taking the standard deduction. But for the sake of fun and exercise, let's just say he did itemize his mortgage interest. If Bob were able to itemize his mortgage interest, then he would claim the $10,000 as his deduction, right? With him being in that 22% tax bracket, we would multiply that 22% times $10,000 and we would get $2,200. Basically, this means that Bob has saved $2,200 because he paid $10,000 in interest. Let's let that marinate for a second. Basically, when people tell you not to pay off your mortgage, because you save in taxes, they're telling you that you should pay the bank $10,000 so you cannot pay the IRS $2,000. This by definition is stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. Now one side item I would mention here, a lot of people are talking about not paying off their homes in order to invest. I think that is a completely separate conversation and probably one that is worth having with your financial advisor, only because mortgage rates are again, we're still at these historic lows. People have mortgages of two and a half, three and a half percent. Meanwhile, if you invested that money over time, you'd probably make it at least five, if not six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent. So it is certainly worth having the conversation with your financial planner. But again, that is a totally different kettle of fish. I'm gonna enjoy this money while I'm young. You can't take it with you when you die. You can absolutely enjoy the money while you're young. However, tomorrow's gonna come. And it's important to be prepared for that. Really, you just need to budget. Honestly, if certain things bring you joy or make your day a little bit more convenient, then there's nothing wrong with spending that money. But if you're not saving any money for the future, it, it's going to come back to bite you. I promise. Yes, enjoy your money while you're young. Go out. Have fun with your friends. Have drinks. Do those things. But budget for it, and don't go too crazy. Your future self will thank you. Money is the root of all evil. I absolutely, positively hate it when people say this. The Bible's pretty clear. The love of money is the root of all evil. We get into trouble when we put money ahead of people. When we overvalue money. I mean, money 
is great. It has its place in our society, obviously. It can buy us it can buy us time actually when you can outsource certain tasks to, to other people, does tasks that you don't desire to do. It gets you your time back. Money is certainly valuable, but you can't put it above people. Money is not inherently evil. Now, money is a magnifier. So if you are a generous and giving person when you're broke, you'd be an extraordinarily generous person if you're wealthy. The same is true if you're a jerk. If you're a disgraceful jerk broke, you're going to be a huge disgraceful jerk uh, rich. That's just the truth. Money itself is just money. It's people that can do good or evil with money. Money's not going to make you happy. This is another one I absolutely hate. Absolutely hate. Is money going to make me happy? No. But it sure as hell ain't going to make me sad. I mean, come on. Really? 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 I mean, you need money. You need money to eat. You need money to get around. You need money. Diapers, food, water, shelter, all these things require money. And... All the statistics prove that no happiness above a certain amount does not increase. Why? Because your needs are filled. So once your needs are filled and you got a little bit more to have to take out to have fun and, and enjoy, obviously above that amount, no more happiness is going to come. But ask someone that is struggling to meet their basic needs if money matters, or if money would more money would make them happy. I'm sure they'd slap you if you looked at them and said some foolishness like that. Alright guys, that'll wrap up this video. This was the five money myths. Well, I shouldn't say the five because there are lots of myths around money. We'll probably do another one of these videos in the future. What are some of the myths that you hear and just make you roll your eyes and cringe and have to bite your tongue to just not yell at people for saying such silly stuff? Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Catch you in the next one. Peace.